The first talk is about related to uh, semi uh, first two talks actually related to semi definite programming. It is one of the uh, most powerful, powerful tools for CR packings and uh, other distributed programs. And uh, Philip Masaru, he is a, uh, he is a postdoc in the Arctic University of Norway, uh, going to present the talk. Please start, Philip. Okay, thank you all like for the introduction. So yeah, I'm very happy to be the to introduce this session about which is yeah oriented about sphere packings and uh, and optimal configurations. So I'm going to talk about a project which was joint work with uh, Maria Dostert, which uh, who would be the, the next speaker, and also David Delat, who is in, in, in Delft. But uh, so since I'm the first one in this in this session, I, I will spend some time also in uh, introducing a bit the 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 topic. I mean, I think since I'm the first talk, I think it makes sense to introduce the, the problems we want to look at. So for instance, in the beginning, I will, I will mention what are the packing problems we want to consider, like optimal configurations, local configurations on, on the sphere most of the times. Then also, like like Oleg said, like the, the first two talks will be about semi-definite semi programming bounds. So I want to give you an idea of how we can use these techniques, like optimization techniques, to, to, to get some results for geometry. So how where do these tools come from and how we, you can use them. So this will be very general and kind of an introduction to the, to the, to the whole session. And then I will focus more about this project. And especially I will focus on where, why we care about uh, having exact bounds. So, so to, to prove the uniqueness of some optimal configuration. And then in, in, the, in, the, in the last part of the talk, I will really mention like what we do and what are the technical issues, which is more algorithmic actually. But, but still I want to spend some time on the, on the geometric uh, background. Okay, so because in general, so if you if you want to use the semi-definite uh, SDP bounds, then you will have some numeric bounds, and then the problem is that from these numeric bounds that you obtain with the computer, you want to turn them into proofs, and this is hard. This is what I, I will I will try to explain to you, and then from this, so we have we want to have a framework in general to to turn the approximate numerical bounds from the computer into some proof, ma mathematical proofs. So this will be the the, the the topic of the, the last part of the talk. Okay, so uh, let me get started. And uh, yeah, also feel free to, to stop me whenever you want and to ask questions. And uh, I mean, we're not so many, so, so it should be, should be fine. All right, so let me start with some, some motivation. So maybe the, the most famous problem in this area will be the, the kissing number problem. So here I'm looking really at a local sphere packing. So I'm not talking about sphere packing in general, but really in a, in a small portion of the space. So for instance, I, I fix one sphere, one unit sphere. And the question is how many other spheres with the same radius can I put around this, this first sphere in such a way that they do not overlap. So in dimension three, for instance, this is what you, you can think of. This is the, 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 the standard configuration with 12 spheres. So here we have three layers of four spheres. And as, as you probably know, this was the question like at the time, back at the time between uh, big fight between New, Newton and uh, Gregory to know whether we can, we can add a 30 ball in this configuration. Because here, if you look at the configuration, you have a lot of freedom, actually. You can, you can move the spheres, you, you can shift them in a continuous way, etc. cetera, you can, you can swap two balls here. So we found that we can add a 13th sphere in this configuration, but actually the answer is no. So this is optimal, we cannot do more, more than 12. Okay, so this is for dimension three. So of course, dimension one and two, this is, this is uh, easy. Dimension three, is already it's, it's a bit harder. Dimension four, this goes back to, to Oleg in, in 2008. So we know the optimal configuration, but it's not, it's conjectured to be unique, but it's something we don't know yet, whether it's unique, it's, I mean, it's not proven. And then in dimension 1824, uh, basically we know everything. So as usual for, uh, for, uh, for sphere packing problems, the answer is given by, by the E8 lattice and the Leach lattice in dimension 24. And those configurations are, are unique. So they are optimal and unique. So as you can see, the dimension 8 and 24 here are easier to understand than dimension 4 already, and, and, and 5, 6, uh, we don't know. We don't even understand. 
okay, so this is the, the maybe the, the main motivation. So this is the kissing number problem. And then you have some variants I want to talk about. So now let's look at the formulation. So if you want to, to look at this, or if you don't think about the center of the spheres, but you, you look at the projection of the centers on the, on the, on the surface of, the, of, of your sphere, the central sphere. Then what you want to do is just, you want to, to put as many points as possible in this sphere in such a way that you control the distance, that here the, the distance between the, those centers is, is at most, uh, so you want the angle to be at most pi over three, right? So here it's, it's the same as controlling the, the inner product. You just want the inner product to be at most one half. Okay, so what you want, you want to put as many points as possible. So this is what we, I would call the code. So you want the largest code on the sphere, such that the, the inner product is at most one half for every pair of distinct points. Okay, and now you can play a bit with the parameters and change the, and change the rules. So this is for the kissing number, but more generally, if you want to change the, the parameter for the, the, the angles, and instead of taking pi over three, you take some, some, some theta, some angle, then you get the problems of finding the best spherical codes. Okay, so, and you want the largest configurations. So you then, you then get theta spherical codes. And something else you can play with is the, 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 the starting set, so the, the contact points. So instead of allowing points, contact points in all the sphere, you can, for instance, just restrict your attention to the, to the upper hemisphere. And this is what uh, Oleg introduced and called the one-sided kissing number. Okay, so you have all these variants. You can play with the, with the, the, angle, the angle constraints. You can play with the, 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 the set constraints. And you have all these kind of problems that, that look very similar. Okay, and here more precisely for our project, we are interested in some special configurations. So configurations that were um, rigid in some sense. So not like the one I, I, I showed you in the beginning in Dimension 3, because here's in this one you have, we had a lot of freedom, but here I would be interested more in some, some more uh, special configuration like that, that we expect them to be unique. So one, one example for this is the square antiprism in dimension three, which was known, so, uh, which was known to be, to be the, the unique optimal theta spherical code for this value of theta that I give you here in dimension three. And so this is known to be optimal and unique. And the proof of these are completely geometric. Like, I mean, you look at all the possible configurations, the angle, this is really purely geometric, the proof. Okay, so this is well, well known. And another example, for instance, it's that if you look at this problem in the hemisphere in dimension eight, so you know that if you look at in the whole sphere, the kissing number, the answer is given by the E8 lattice. So this gives you some configuration on the hemisphere. And uh, what was proven, so first conjecture by Oleg, so that this was optimal, and actually this was proven by, by Bashak and Valentin in 2008, but they couldn't prove the uniqueness. And so our first motivation for this project was to prove uniqueness of this, of this configuration, okay? So this is what we do. And, and now in the end, so this was the initial motivation, but in the end, this, this be became a bit more general because we wanted a general method to prove this kind of results by using optimization. So in the end, what we do, we, proved the, we will prove the uniqueness of this configuration, but also we will get an, a new proof of the optimality and uniqueness of this configuration using optimization. Okay, so this is just to give you an overview. Uh, any questions so far, maybe? Okay, so now let's go a bit more into the detail. So I told you this was just the geometric motivation. I told you this has some relation with optimization. So now I just want to convince you and to, to, to give you some idea how this is related to optimization and to optimization technique. And actually, I want to tell you that this, this can be understood as a graph theoretical problem. So now if you look at the graph where the set of vertices will be the, the, con the possible contact points, so the sphere or the hemisphere, and you, you put an edge into, between two points if the distance is too close. So if two points are too close, then the, you have this constraint that you, they cannot lie in the same, in the same spherical code. So you put an edge in, in, in between. And in this case, what you want to understand, you want to understand the independence number of this graph. Okay, so you have an infinite graph, the set of vertices is the sphere, and you want to compute the independence number of this graph. Okay, and the idea is then to use the, 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 the techniques from the graph theory part to, to compute some bounds on the independence number of, the, of this graph. 
okay? So to get lower bounds, then you, you, pro, you come up with some construction. And what I would be more interested in today is, will be the upper bounds, how to, how to prove they are optimal, okay? And to this, so for finite drops, we know that, that we can, we have some bounds on the, on the dependence number. So you have some hierarchies of, of uh, semi-definite programming bounds. Um, the, the most famous is the last hierarchy. And this has been generalized by, by uh, Delat and Valentin to infinite graph. And especially that we, in such a way that we can use these kind of things for our problems. Okay, and this is actually related to some previous uh, bound that were so known as the two-point bound from Delsart and also the three-point bound for, uh, from uh, Bashok and Valentin. But you can see this as some, the first steps of some uh, hierarchy of, of SDP to, to compute bounds of the independence number of infinite graphs. Okay, so now I just want to give you an idea of how these, these bounds work, like this two-point bound and three-point bound. Okay, so let me tell you about the two-point bound which is easier to understand, but to, and I just want to, to tell you the ideas and then you will see that this, this will be the same thing, basically. So the, the most important thing is what is the, the orthogonal group of the, of the sphere, okay? So using this, you can, so you have one first observation is that any pair of points, so x, y, in a spherical pole, you can just re represent it just by in the linear product because up to symmetry, you can, you can think that one of them is the north pole, and then up to rotation, the only thing you want to understand is what is the distance between the north pole and this point, okay? So you just represent a couple by the, the inner product U between them. And this will be one if you have the same point. And otherwise, if they are in the same code, then this will be something which is at most cosines, the cosine of, of theta. Okay, so this is the first ingredient. And then you can use also this, uh, the, the theory of Gegenbauer polynomials that capture, that, that really give you uh, a basis of the, the how many polynomials of, of this on the sphere. And the important property that, that will be useful for me is that now if you take these Gegenbauer polynomials, if you take any configuration of the sphere, so not only you know, spherical codes, but any configuration of the sphere, and you sum over all the pairs in the configuration of the, this polynomial evaluated in the inner product, then you get something positive. Okay, so these are univariate polynomials. And when you sum over all the pairs, you get something which is positive. And this will be really key tool to get some, some, some bounds from, from, from linear program. Okay. So now let me try to explain to you how, how to use these things to get some bounds on the size of code. So now assume you have a function, a polynomial, that can be written as a linear combination of these Gegenbauer polynomials with positive coefficients. What I will tell you, so, so you take such a function and you assume that f of u is less than minus one for every, for every u such this will be the possible inner product in your configuration, okay? What I want to tell you is that whenever you give me such a function, then this will give me a, a bound on the best possible size of, of, the, of the code. Or is that true? So you take a spherical code and you look at, so you will sum of this, this function over all the pairs and as usual, you have a double sum, so you have two ways to compute the sum. So first of all, you just expand the sum and you have a positive combination of this sum over all the pairs. And as I told you, this is here non-negative. So if you take a non-negative combination, you will have something which is non-negative. So on the one hand, this is non-negative. And then if you sum in the, the other way around, then you just split the sum in two when the two points are equal. So you take current of the codes times f of one plus the sum where they are different. And here in this domain, you know that this is always bounded both by, by minus one. So in this case, you just have this bound here. So this is just in current you have C times F of one minus C plus one. And now if you, if you, if you get just the left-hand side and the right-hand side, this gives you a, side, a bound on the side of the code. This tells you that the current of the code is at most F of one plus one, okay? So whenever, just the, things, the thing to remember here is that whenever you give me such a function that satisfies those two properties, then f of, more, f of one will give me a bound on the, 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 the highest possible size of, of such a spherical code. Okay. And now what I want to do, if I want to get the best bound, then I need to, to understand what will be the best function for this, what will be the best polynomial, okay? So now I will optimize over all such functions. So I will optimize over all the functions that satisfy this minus one property. 
and I want to run through all the possible positive combinations of this of these polynomials of this gegenbauer polynomial. Okay, so now if you give me one function, you have a bound, and now I want to optimize over all the all the possible functions. All right, and this is linear programming because here you have all the conditions that are that are linear. Okay, so all of the inequalities are over R, so you have really linear inequalities. So this is why we call it a linear programming bound. Okay, and now. And just let me show you how the three-point bound look like, and you will see that this this look a bit like this one with some with some fundamental differences though. So again, you do the same, but now instead of looking at two points, you look at three points. So what happens now? Instead of having one coordinate, you need three coordinates to represent them, like all the mutual distances, basically. And the domain will be a bit different, but basically you need just to de to decide where the three points are equal, or two points are equal, or they are all distant. Okay, so you have just a generalization that looks a bit more complicated, but that's exactly it. And more importantly, what's important is now, instead of the Gegenbauer polynomials, in this time, in this case, we have matrix, matrix polynomials. Okay, so you have matrices in three variable where the coefficients are polynomial in three variables. And you have the, the analog of this property of positivity. And now the analog will be that if you sum over all the triples, and you evaluate these this, uh, matrices into the, the inner products, then this will be a matrix that will be positive semi-definite. Okay, so now instead of having an, an, uh, an equation in R, now I have matrix positivity, so the analog will be, will be PSD mass. Okay, and now if I translate this, this kind of, of method into the, this setting, I would, won't have a linear programming one, but uh, an SDP one. And now I can optimize over all the functions. That will be exactly the same thing. You don't need to look about all the details, but I just want to tell you this, this will be exactly the, the same thing. So now we want to optimize over all such functions, but now instead of optimizing over the coefficients that will be just coefficients in, in R, now we want to optimize over some matrices, and these matrices have to be have to be semi positive semi-definite. And this is exactly what we call semi-definite programming. So we have linear constraints and PSD constraints. Okay, so you have some matrices that have to be positive semi-definite and satisfying some linear constraints. Okay, so this is a, a generalization. And so now the variables are, are not any more coefficients, but, but matrices. Okay, and this in practice, you can compute these bounds using this sum squares technique. So basically all, all these inequalities of polynomials, you can translate them into, into sum of squares conditions. Like you can check that these things are, are, are non-negative if and only if they're, uh, not if and only if, but if they are written as, as sum of squares, you can prove that they are non-negative. And this gives you some relaxation that you can compute in practice using uh, SDP programs and these SDP softwares. Okay, so this I can compute in practice, basically I can compute some bound. Okay, so these are the techniques. And now let's, let's, let's get a bit more into detail and see why we need, about, why we need exact bounds. So now, assume you have a configuration that you know. So for instance, you want to show that this configuration with 183 points in dimension eight is, is optimal. Then, I mean, the only thing you need to have is you need to have an upper bound which would be less than 184, okay? If you know that this is less than, since you're looking for an integer number, then you know that any, any upper bound lower than n plus one will prove that this configuration is optimal. And in this case, it's not so hard to turn the, the numerical bound into, into something which, which will be really a, a formal proof. Okay, in this case, if you pay some price into, into the objective, you can, you can prove really the exactness of the, of the proof. So now the question is, okay, now what do I want in a problem which is exactly the size of the code? And here, this thing is that, okay, you have two motivations. First, you have a motivation from the optimization point of view, which is, okay, when do I have exactly the independence number of the graph? But here, and especially for us today, more importantly, we have some geometric, uh, geometric consequences because when I have a sharp bound, and this I don't have time to go so much into details of this, but if I have a sharp bound, this will give me some further information about what, have, what has to be an optimal configuration. For instance, for spherical codes, if you, get, if you find a function that will give you the exact upper bound you wanted, 
Then this function will tell you what are the possible inner products between the points in, uh, into, in, an, uh, in an optimal configuration. And that's very important because usually when you have this, then in some cases, this is already enough to prove that the configuration has to be the one you expect and you cannot do anything else. Okay, so if you have an exact bound, then this gives you some information about the geometry of, of the configuration. And then by understanding this geometry, you can prove that the configurations are unique. Okay, so just to recap what we did here. So for spherical codes, we have these two kinds of bound, the LP bound and the SDP bound, two point bound, three point bound. And now if you look at in the hemisphere, for instance, then we cannot use the two point bound. So the only thing we can apply in this kind of things are the three point bound. And the, Okay, and so to sum up what, what we did, so we have many examples where this is like for the optimality of E8, for instance, this was proven with the, the linear programming method. So you find a function which is very nice. You can understand what are the, the possible inner products. You can, you can prove that you have something which is, which is uh, you can understand the, the inner products. And then you can prove that the unique optimal configuration will be E8. But in the SDP case, you don't have many examples where SDP gives you something more than LP and the bound will be sharp. Okay. But still you have some examples. So there were an example that was pointed out by, by Bashok and Valentin, which is the Peterson code in dimension four. So they proved that this was a unique optimal configuration. But the way they did it was a bit uh, was not very general, was very really specific. Like they they really tried to to run these matrices in, in in some special case. And here with our method, we can reprove this result in in a more direct way in some sense. Then they also mentioned that their bound was numerically sharp for the square antiprism I sh showed you before, but they couldn't prove the, the, the uniqueness with their method. So here we, we reprove this with, with optimization method and very few geometry, but still with some geometry. And also we could prove that the E8 uh, lattice was, was the optimal one in, in dimension one, in dimension eight, and was unique, okay? Which was the, 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 the first thing we wanted to prove. Okay. So this was for the result. Any questions so far before I, I mentioned the techniques we want to use? So now I'll try to explain you how, how we do in practice. So how we deal with this, with this uh, numerical stuff. So I don't expect you to be very, very familiar with SDP in general. So, so just if you want to understand how it goes, Forget about all the polynomials and all what I showed you. The important thing is that now your, your bound will be written like this. You want to, to minimize some linear, uh, some linear form over a set of X such that you have some linear constraints and some matrices that have to be positive semi-definite. Okay, so basically you give this to the, to the computer and the computer will give you some, some, some solution of, of this problem. Okay, so you have some vector X that you want to find and that has to satisfy some, some linear constraints and some PSD constraints, okay? You have really two kinds of constraints. But in general, the problem is that solving this exactly, this is in general very hard. And you, I mean, so you have some approach to, to do that, but this only works for very small examples. And the example we want to consider are much bigger. We have much, much many variables. It's much harder to understand. So in general, what people do in practice, they just send this to the computer. And the problem is that the computer, the solver, just gives back some approximate solution, which is in floating points, so nothing exact. And then you have this numerical solution. But for us, the problem is that we want something exact in such a way to get really a math proof. Okay. So the question we had is, okay, how can we do now? How do we do to, to turn this approximate solution into something exact? That will give you really my, my formal proof. In general, it's very hard because even if you have uh, an SDP which is defined like all the coefficients here in A and in the in the objective here are rational, then it has been shown that maybe you need to go to to go to high algebra degree to to find a solution. Okay, but here in our case, it's a bit special. In our case, we expect to find a solution in the field where the the problem is defined. So, for instance, for E8, we we expected to find a solution over Q. 
And for this quality prism, for instance, we expect it to find a solution over, over this quadratic, over some quadratic field. So here we're in the particular case where we really want to find a solution in some given, in some given small space, like algebraically easy. Okay. So let me give you the idea of how it works over Q. So first you solve it numerically. So you get this, this solution in uh, high precision. So, and you get this approximate solution. What does it mean to have approximate solution? This means that you have a vector X star, such that the linear conditions are almost satisfied. So this means that X, A, A X tilde is almost B. So the difference will be very small. And the, the blocks of so the matrices you want them to be PSD and they are almost PSD. So what does it mean? That if you look at their eigenvalues, either they are, they are positive or they are very close to zero, but, but they, might be, they might be negative. And the goal, you want something such that you just, you, you want to round, like in the philosophy is that you want to round your solution. So you want something such that the linear constraints will be satisfied and you want the, the matrices to be to be uh, to be positive same definite so you don't want any negative eigenvalues so how do you get this, this solution so first you you want to deal with the affine conditions so you have this linear system here you can you can and you do like like you do in linear algebra 1 like you put you take your matrix you put it in the reduced row echelon 4 you can do this in in with rational arithmetic and then you do it by back substitution and every time you have some freedom, you want to take a, a, a free variable. Then you take something which was in, in, your, in your solution, which is very close. And then if you do that, then you're sure that you will get the solution X, which is very close from X star, just a small perturbation, and the linear, the linear system will be satisfied, okay? But then what you want is to understand, you want to understand whether the, the blocks are still PSD or not. Did you change eigenvalues or not? So what you expect, you expect that you won't change so much the eigenvalues. So if all the eigenvalues here were already very positive and very far from zero, then they will stay positive, zero. They will stay positive. So the problem will come actually from the small, from the small eigenvalues, the ones that are close to zero. So in this case, they are close to zero. Basically, if you just do this rounding, like I told you before, then you will get some negative eigenvalues because uh, I mean you will you will get off the the the, the cone of positive semi infinity matrices. So the problem is how do I deal with the near zero eigenvalue? Well, the idea is actually if I have some some eigenvalue which is very close to zero numerically, this means it has to be to zero. So what we want to do, we want to force them to be zero. So generally, you can use geometry actually to have some more condition and to find this thing to be to be zero, and in some in like in the literature, usually that was that was enough, but for us it wasn't enough. But now in this case, uh, this was not enough, so we want to find some general way to understand these these zero eigenvalues. So what we want to do now, we want to understand what are these possible uh, these zero eigenvalues. So we want to understand what are the kernels of of our uh, of our solution, okay? So let me just finish with the, our procedure to give you an idea of how it works. So first you compute the, this approximate solution. Then you want to compute the kernels of, of the numerical solution. So you have something which is approximate and you want to run this, these kernels. So here you use the LLL algorithm to find some, some, some some combination to find some relation between these numbers, and then you want to turn into the, the exact curve. Okay, so now you get new linear constraints that you will add into the into the linear system. Okay, so then you have the linear system which is more complicated, but in which you force these eigenvalues to be exactly zero, and then you will be sure that they are not negative. And then you do this row addition trick and this this back substitution. You solve it, you back substitute, and then you check that what you got in the end where uh, the blocks are exactly PSD. So the linear system will be will be will be satisfied. The, the matrices you have will be PSD, so you found your solution which is exact. And then you need to and then you need to use geometry to make sure that you have exactly the information you need. Okay. And yeah, this is uh, basically what I wanted to to, to tell you. So I'm, I'm open to any question. Okay, any question? Oh, can you, uh, I have a question about that. You know, 
You mentioned you mentioned when you round and cover Q. Can you give us some example? I mean, like because we uh, we know several several soft uh, several soft cases using. Uh, you mentioned uh, some of them, you know, uh, uh, before. Can you give like uh, which one we have actually considered like when uh, when we have the eigenvalues uh, small enough, right? And the, I remember the first example uh, when give uh, the proof in, uh, uh, this one uh, in, in four dimension by Basho yeah. Valentin. Can you just do I don't know classify cases uh, from this point of view? From uh, what do you mean by classified? Uh, classified, I mean from the uh, eigenvalues point of view. What, what they have uh, in these cases? Actually, I, I, I'm, I'm not familiar with that. Is it small enough? I'm uh, f f the first example. Okay, first, uh, first of all, maybe give, uh, give. Uh, can you give uh, exactly cases what already solved using this method? Yeah. So this is where the yeah. Yeah, you have some right. Yeah, for this mm -hmm. one. Yeah, so the first one you're mentioning, right? That this was? No, all of them, you know, but just to play, maybe, maybe to discuss a little bit okay, uh, yeah. more details so about the, um, all of this case. Okay. Okay. So for, for the person, for the person code, what, what's happening is that the, the matrices are not so big. Like the dimension of the matrices are not so big, so you don't have so many coefficients. So that basically what they what they did is just doing by, by hand, like looking at what were the coefficients, what were the, the equations that had to be satisfied by the coefficients. And then they didn't have, like this, they could kill all the zero again values and to force them. But this was more by hand because you don't have so many, like the size of the matrices are not so big, okay? The second one, they basically couldn't do the same thing because it was, uh, it was not over Q anymore. This was over, over Q of square root of D. And then this kind of thing was, was harder for them. And here, this one was just too big. I mean, because here, this is dimension eight. So the number, of, the size of the matrices is huge. So the, the number of variables and this kind of thing, it's very hard to do by hand and to understand what are all the, all the possible, uh, all the possible eigenvectors. So really you need in this case to do something which is, which is more general, that would be understanding the gamut. Okay, I'm not sure I'm answering the question. No, yeah, yeah. But uh, do you know, uh... Okay, and the last one uh, I remember the present, uh, no, presentation by Maria, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you have, yeah, and uh, the it is also it is also not not rational, right? I mean, the last case, third case, the third it's case. Not so. No, it is rational. It is rational. It's rational, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. So they exactly follow this. Uh, I mean, this method. Right? Yeah, yeah. So this is general. So now, yeah. So the first were were known, and so so like the second was known, like with with pure geometry. But now we have this this framework when we have this procedure in which we we, we give this example to the to the to the computer, and then it gives us the exact function that will that will that will work, like the optimal function over either over Q or over Q of square root of T. And then we can play with this function and check the roots, like to find the possible end products. And then we, we still need to do geometry, right? But our machinery, you give the, the configuration and this gives you the, the magic function you want in this case. Mm -hmm. okay. And we don't have to look at the matrices, the computer does it for us. And then we get something exact. So that's why in, in some sense, it's, some more, it's a unified way to, 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 to see the, the, those results. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. More questions, comments? Okay, thank you. It's very, for me, it's very, it was very interesting, and especially because you put together all cases. Yeah, it is clear that it's very technical because it's just, usually it is not like uh, to explain uh, in, in, the, in the case of linear programming, you can draw some graphs, right? Exactly. But yeah. here it is, it is uh, very complicated. To and you can write a function, yeah, like for EH, you yeah, can write yeah. a function and you have these this four inner products that you want. And yeah, but here it's, it's more complicated. Yeah, but, oh, okay. And in this case, in the three, uh, it's uh, uh, in the multivariate function because in three variables, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's... So it's more. Okay. Okay. All right.